We didn't think that it would happen to our family because we're seeing Uyinene, we're seeing other people. Like somebody so close to us, we didn't think that it would actually happen to somebody so close to us. We are mourning a senseless death. It's not fair that parents have to bury their own children. It is not fair that on Saturday there is a grandmother who will watch her grandchild coughing the sand into the ground. It's difficult to make sense of this thing that is happening to us. Um, it's difficult to make sense of the way that we're dying. It's difficult to make sense of having to bury in Dangaze to basically um, on the grounds that they were killed by their partners. To try and make sense of the femicide and where it stems from, we looked at possible societal factors contributing to the senseless murders of women. We asked a few male road students what they regard as consent. For me, consent is, I guess, it's, in a nutshell, it's the word yes. And more than that, it's body language. It's also um, the connection that you have with someone. I think you know when someone means yes and someone means no. And someone says yes when they mean no. And someone says no when they mean yes. I think consent essentially is using that connection and you knowing that person to make the right decision when they say yes or no. You don't do things without, without being granted consent. So if she didn't say yes, then there's no sexual intimacy. Yeah, I think consent based in base form is just the permission, if that makes sense. Like an agreeable between two parties on the events that are about to occur. Not even in terms of sexual relations, generally consent is someone giving you the go ahead or letting you know that they're comfortable. My view of consent, right? Um, bearing in mind I'm a black queer woman, um, very closer, and I think I depart from a place I've heard a friend of mine depart where she says, um, in intimate relationships, consent is a very cultural thing. And in our relationships, we build cultures of consent, right? We build ways of communicating our yeses and our noes as women. Um, the friend who I talk about goes further to make sense of it and say, um, how do we make sense of a consent where she, as a Zulu woman, has been taught that in order to be a respectable woman, you need to first play coy and, 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 right? But obviously, that is in particular types of relationships, right? We have known you for a while, we have built my particular languages um, with you, and you've come to understand that language. Using consent as the point of departure, we discuss the term toxic masculinity and its underlying ideological meaning in society. I'd say the disregard for consent. Um, most of our peers, they, they don't take it. They don't take it very seriously. It's hard to see a woman past her past her appearance a lot of the times as groups of men. Like I think that's in its in its own is just toxic. Not taking people for who they are, but what they look like. Uh, objectifying women, so looking at women as objects. Number two, it is uh, having um, entitlement over women's bodies. Uh, number three, it would be uh, a trait where someone would not allow themselves to be vulnerable as a man and, um, and showing emotions. Catcalling or people just looking at women in a way that just seems suggestive, you know. Usually it happens within, uh, amongst male social groups when they're talking and conversing, just boys talking, you know, you know, in conversations, could be group chats or whatnot, anything that's just misogynistic. That she's playing hard to get or whatever, that if she says no, it's just her, I don't know, it's just her making the whole ordeal fun. I think what toxic masculinity refers to is this constant hunger and need to take complete control of a space, you know, to monopolize space and to monopolize um, bodies in that space and show that you have power over that space, over and above anyone else. Right? Do I think guys are educated? Yes, I think that they know um, what they're doing and I know they know that it's wrong, you know. But it goes, it boils down to benefiting from the system. I myself have particular traits that are very masculine, um, at a time very toxic, right? But I know that those traits benefit me, right? So we're in this constant 
there's this constant need for us to be introspective, right, in the way that we do things. Right? I don't think that people are not aware of toxic masculinity. I think they're very aware from, of it. It's just the case that they benefit out from it. We cannot say that um, the man who murdered Uyinene was not aware that what he was doing is wrong, right? And that's an extreme case of toxic masculinity. But in the same, sp in the same breath, we cannot say that I don't know, Umduase Rhodes, who is perhaps homophobic, is unaware of their homophobia. I think we're very aware human beings and we're very introspective beings as it's our nature, you know, to be very introspective. Um, I just think that we benefit from it and so we have no vested interest in changing those traits or those ways of being. I said in the chat of a few weeks ago, I think that women die deaths long before they are even killed by their partners and the violent ways in which they are dying. We die to ourselves, we die to our femininity, we die we die in the spaces that we occupy, right? And, and it's a very type of spiritual death, right? And, it, and, and that occurs because there's a very particular way to exist as a woman, right? There's a very particular way to navigate violence, right? And I can't make like the causal link and say it causes feminicide, but I think that it's a very important way or, or to make sense of how patriarchy functions, right? Um, and it functions by telling you Kaka, you're wearing a skirt and a shirt right now. That's not okay, right? And because of the length of your skirt, you are opening yourself up to violence and, 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 and. And sort of putting the onus of protecting themselves onto the female body rather than saying to men or to people, stop raping, guys. Stop, stop, stop. Stop doing this thing um, so that we can just live. We then explored the link between toxic masculinity, rape culture, and femicide. When you have entitlement, you have an attitude that you can do whatever with this body and you have a right to do that. And definitely when you have that kind of attitude, you are going to uh, be in a position where you, number one, you feel okay with raping. Number two, you would feel okay with killing a woman. It won't mean anything to you because you, you feel entitled to their body. The power that we as men are born with uh, should be in the advantage of women and children and not be a weapon against them and a threat to them. So that would be number one. Number two is to ensure that each and every man amongst us, we educate each other about issues of femicide, about issues of toxic masculinity, uh, about uh, various issues that contribute towards uh, the scourge of femicide that we are facing right now. So Nombu and the boyfriend had been dating for quite some time. So hence, I said earlier, um, it, was, it was a shock. It was a shock for us to find out that he's the one who actually who actually murdered her. He's the one who actually took her life. We did not expect it because we yeah, knew him. My grandmother, grandmother knew him. This man, this man sometimes. would sometimes like beat her. She was, she was in love and trying to protect this man. She didn't make it known to the family. And just a month and before her death, he went into my grandmother's house and broke one of the windows. By just looking at that, you could see that maybe there were violent traits that he had that we might not have been aware of. Various platforms have been availed for discussions around femicide. However, the majority of males believe that these spaces are not progressive as they feel attacked when voicing their opinions. For example, a few weeks ago, there was the Imbizo talk. Um, and then, like, so like I talked to a couple of my friends and I was like, let's go. And they were like, um, no, they're just going to grill us there. In participating in these conversations, you know, um, a lot of men will say that women are attacking them, you know, or, or that they feel like these conversations are not productive because of the strength of the female voice, right? Um, and I make a great, uh, an example of, of the Imbizo men's talk that was had. A lot of men didn't go to that chat because they felt it wouldn't be productive. It goes back to the point that I make on disingenuous conversations, right? And I think that we need to take very seriously the need to create spaces that are conducive for honest conversation. Um, because immediately a men's talk is filled with women. You're going to have 
the woke patriarchy coming out, you know, the patriarchs who say one thing but practice another thing coming out, you know, and I think that's very much more dangerous than any other type of patriarchy because it makes us think we're living in a particular society with particular types of men when that is not the case. I do believe that the presence of female voices at times means that men are not able to have that honest conversation because I think the feminist culture that has been built at Rhodes University means that that is the case, right? Um, and I think that we must be very honest when we talk about that. We have a very particular feminist culture that makes men react in spaces of conversation in very particular ways. Just a few days ago, I was at Nelson Mandela University and I was stunned at the way in which men are still participating in conversations that are about women. Because that at Rhodes University doesn't happen, right? When you say it's a chat about women or women's rights or whatever the case may be, a lot of men don't even speak. Um, but I think that men need to be careful about where they use their voices. And I don't think that women don't have to be careful either. At a men's talk, I felt very con uncomfortable because I did not understand what my role was there, right? I was there to basically be a moderator to what these men's, men are saying and to, to correct with a red pen what they are saying. Whereas I think that men do need spaces to make sense of their beings, make sense of their violence, make sense of their ways of, of becoming and make sense of the people that they are um, before I then come and add my two cents as a person who has never been a male, does not identify as a male, has not nothing that, like, attaches me to the male experience, right? But I also think that men cannot use the presence of women as a scapegoat, right? They cannot use the presence of women and, and, and argue that they're being attacked when what is actually happening is that women in this country and across the world are begging to be seen as humans, right? Are begging for the right to walk in the street whenever they want, right? Are begging to feel safe in the countries and the places that they live, they live right? And I think that it's very unfair to to call that an attack when it's actually a really honest and earnest plea to just exist. It's still devastating. But yeah, we trust God. We trust God and we just hope that justice is going to be is going to be served. Recent laws were passed following the femicide rates. These include no bail for suspects charged with rape and murder of women, no parole when found guilty, and an additional budget of 1.1 billion was allocated to fight gender-based violence and femicide. Laws do not change a country. Budgets do not change a country. That's not going to happen. Um, we can see it in how, for example, South Africa in the African context is one of the best places to live if you are gay because of the laws that it has in place. But when we look at the statistics of the violence that queer, and, uh, queer women, for example, face, then the reality that we deal with is very different. And that has to do with the fact that legislating alone does not change a country. We need to have these conversations. We need to change the ways families are raising their children, right? And it is very hard work because it involves interrogating our own being interrogating where we come from, interrogating our own families, um, and finding those contradictions, right? The contradiction between Kakanipo, the feminist that I am, and Kakanipo, the child that I am in my grandmother's house, right? And it involves challenging those contradictions, which then also challenges our feeling of belonging in the spaces that we are. Um, it involves integrating feminist discourse in the very culture and fabric of our communities, right? Such that issues of consent are as integral to the existence of a community as issues of, say, water and electricity. Right. I, I, I said once in an interview that I dream of a South Africa where we will sit in meetings at Bahali, who discuss where issues that women face, right? And that those faces who will be having those discussions won't just be females. It will be all that who are saying Haibo Umfazwam is experiencing this type of issue, this type of problem, right? And I think that developing that competency requires a lot more than laws. It requires us going into our communities with the language that our communities use and packaging our activism. And for me, that is what activism is all about, right? My activism is not that Cyril Ramaphosa will change laws. My activism is so that one day I will hear Utatawa Selalini 
talking about the issues that women and children face in this country with the same vigor that he would say talk about issues as Jongen and Ngomo and livestock um, is Lali. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in legal frameworks or in even um, budgets as a way of changing the country. I think those are important things to look for and to want as well. But I think first and foremost, it starts with the community.